I'm Kelly Andresik. I'm the Natural Resources Manager um, for the Houston Parks and Recreation Department. And Oh, I do. Okay. Uh, so the Natural Resources Management Program, um, basically we work to preserve the undeveloped land within Houston Parks. And we looked at, you know, all the aerial images of the parks. And there's approximately 374 parks that changes a little bit. Um, and then we, notif we identified that 80 of those parks had some type of natural area over an acre. And then that's what would fall within the jurisdiction of the Natural Resources Program. Um, it, it's approximately 16,000 acres. We have not covered all of that area. Um, we have a few bigger locations, like Houston Wilderness Park is almost 5,000 acres. Um, right now we're looking at um, identifying really good, you know, some of the larger properties and having those designated as nature preserves. So that's um, one policy that we're currently creating to try and provide some protection um, of these parks so that they're not developed. A lot of these parks get master plans on them and um, or people would see a park and you know think that the parks department may not be paying attention to that park or that location within a park and having this designation would show that we are paying attention to these areas and um, you know the intention is to preserve them um, for habitat and wildlife and um, so that should be coming pretty soon. One thing that uh, we're starting to look at with, you know, the hurricane and, um, you know, we have all the natural resources program is grant funded. And so some of our grants are coming through are for treating water quality. Most of our bodies do not meet for at least one of the parameters. Uh, many of them are bacteria. Um, and so we're trying to look at within parks, how can we do more green infrastructure and how can we impact um, multiple parameters and, and uh, for air quality and certainly we work with our forestry department um, to you know have trees pr plant trees in parks we have planting events and um, and like I said a lot of our grants are for um, treating water quality flood retention is a is a big one and without doing retention ponds how can we create habitat that will um, prevent flooding issues and then certainly wildlife habitat is is one of our main priorities we have currently um, five different parks with prairie restoration and so that's been a big one that we've been promoting for flood retention and it's about 160 acres total uh, prairie restoration that we're working on right now and we have two parks where we're doing um, some riparian restoration and that's um, you know we're we're trying to think how what can we do citywide because so far we've just been we've been identifying little parks throughout our park system that may have really good habitat and we want to do some prairie restoration and how can we um, you know look at a bigger picture how can we impact all of these things all of all of these air quality water quality wildlife habitat throughout the city and so one of the plans we came up with was um, the Houston Parks riparian restoration plan and that first of all riparian habitat is the the area adjacent to a bayou, and this is a really good picture showing it. This is Keith Wise Park, and it shows the prairie habitat, and then you see the darker area, and this is 1944 inch, um, is the, riparian, the forested riparian habitat along that. And then this is the current picture. Um, all along the outside of the park has been completely developed as houses around the outside. So, of course, that impacted um, some of the processes that Andy mentioned earlier, the fire. Um, of course, wildfires wouldn't move through that area anymore, and, um, and the bison. So then it became forested, and that's what's happening and has happened with many of our parks. Um, if you can look at the aerial images of our parkland and the natural areas, and most of them were uh, prairie habitat historically. And we try to, the prairie habitat, um, you know, is a goal for us for to meet this historical habitat. But in many instances in these parks, it's just not realistic. So if there's undeveloped land um, in Clear Lake, we have a 72-acre undeveloped portion of Sylvan Rodriguez Park um, that we're going to start doing prairie restoration on. And that, it was undeveloped, and 
Um, so it w that was easy for us to pick. And, and really, if you look on the historic imagery for Sylvan Rodriguez Park, you can see the pretty potholes on there. It's never been tilled. It's never, the development hasn't happened there. So that one is a good one. But when you walk out there, you can't tell that it was pretty because it's completely covered in Chinese tallow. Um, so it looks like a forested park. And, um, and that one, we start work on in October, and um, the, the tallow trees are coming out. And we have a chipping contractor going through and taking that out. And, and one of our issues with the city is people see the, you know, the parks and a tree is a tree. And they don't recognize Chinese tallow trees, and they just you know, think that you're cutting down trees in parks. And it's, it's really a big deal. So a lot of what we do is you know, trying to do community outreach and talking about some of these historical areas and, and that this was prairie and, and showing them the images of the potholes and, and that that's what we're going back towards. Um, but as far as the green infrastructure, you know, I'm really racking my brain for how, you know, the definition of green infrastructure is connections and, and all of these things for water and air quality. And, and then we have these riparian, two riparian restoration projects currently. And, um, you know, why wouldn't we restore all riparian areas? W wouldn't it be fantastic if we could restore the riparian buffer along all of our bayous? And of course, I can't do that because I don't own all that land. The Parks Department doesn't own all the land along the bayous. But we do have um, a significant number of parks. And so we have, uh, we looked at it and we have 70 parks that are adjacent to a bayou or a stream um, that we could potentially do riparian restoration in. And most of these parks, they're, we divide it into two categories. One of them is mowed parkland up till you get to the bayou. So it's, it's just, there's, there's no riparian buffer at all. It's just been completely cleared. Um, and so those we call creation habitat. So there's, we have different standards for how we would restore those. And then the other one is enhancements where that riparian buffer is there and 100% of the cases, it is degraded. So there's invasive species in it. Um, and so we, we call those our enhancement. And to figure out the cost of all this, we have different spacing for, of tree plantings for those and, and different um, needs for contractors to come in and help with those. Um, so the 70 parks, and this is just, it's, it's hard to do a map because Houston's so big to show all these parks. And they look really tiny, but some of these are hundreds of acres. And, um, and we looked at these buffer um, areas. And um, so this is Sims Bayou. And this is the one that we're, we're probably going to target first to complete the entire restoration project. And we started at Melby Park. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then we also have a project at Robert C. Stewart Park. So going all along the bayou, we looked at doing a 100-foot buffer strip, which is what we did at Melby. And um, you know, trying to choose the the buffer distance um, was a little bit of a challenge, but one of the main um, limiting factors is, you know, these parks are used for multiple purposes, so a lot of them already have development in them. One good thing about the riparian project is that there's generally not that much development right up against the bayou. So it's a little bit easier, and a lot of those were clear already to come in. Um, and so. For now, we're looking at the creation ones, the ones that are just mode parkland, doing the 100-foot buffer strip. Some of the enhancement ones, if, if there's already 200 feet of trees, we're, we'll just take it all. We'll just restore that whole buffer. Um, this is the, just to look at Braze Bayou. And, and one issue that we're um, have, going to have to deal with is Harris County Flood Control does have an easement through some of these. So working with Harris County Flood Control, um, to see if we are allowed to plant in their easement at Milby. We weren't allowed to plant in the easement. Um, this is White Oak Bayou. And we have our, one of our projects is White Oak Parkway. Um, so this is our Milby riparian restoration project. And um, this is a 100-foot buffer. You can see the Harris County Flood Control easement. And at Milby, they would not let us plant our trees in their easement. So we had to go out of that. But we still did it, and we still did our 100-foot buffer. There's just a slight mowed gap <laughs> in a portion of the park that's the Harris County Flood Control easement. 
they have calculations for flooding that um, you know their engineers came up with and um, we had a grant for this already and so they said we could potentially apply and work with them to see if the calculations could be redone but it would be you know a year or two before we had the results so um, we didn't have that because this was grant funded so we had to proceed with it and we we just had to um, you know, work with other entities. The Houston Parks Board has their Bayou Greenways Trail going through this park now. And initially it was coming through this area that we had identified as doing restoration in, but they were, they were really easy to work with and they just moved it right outside our buffer. And now we have this trail that, and it works out for us too because we have, you know, this access to our site so people can come and we have interpretive signage that's going in at the site. and. Um, you know, that helps us with our education message about these riparian areas. And now um, there's a lot more people that are coming through this park because of that trail. And, and that's another one of the entities that we're going to have to work with because their trails are coming along a lot of our bayous. So just working with them to, they, they like to put their trails, uh, you know, close to the bayou so people can have that access and that, that visual to the bayous. And so it's just working with them and flood control. And, um, you know, this was a specific case and they said that it was a federal project and they, you know, um, channelize SIMS. And um, so I think it's a case-by-case -case basis with flood control, but um, we have to work with them. So for Milby, I didn't intend this to be a pilot project, but it's just done so well and we've had a lot of good feedback on it that this is really our pilot project for some of this restoration. And But I, I do like research. And so um, whenever we first started this, um, I was hoping that we would do more riparian projects. And so we, we started to put in these treatment plots so that we could measure the, um, you know, how can we control this herbaceous? Because really this was, you know, 80% guinea grass and then a mix of other invasives coming up. Um, and so how are we going to prevent this herbaceous vegetation from overtaking the trees that we're planting? And we've put in over 2,000 trees at this site. Um, and so we, we did half acre plots. Uh, so we did a mow treatment, a mat treatment, herbicide treatment, mulch, uh, no treatment, and then we did a till treatment. And so it was an acre total and then we divided them into two half acre sections so we could spread it out. This area is pretty unique. It's really, um, another thing with the parks is some of them have been filled, um, you know, to, to build up the area for um, different things. This one is frequent, it's not that frequently flooded, but uh, once or twice a year it is, so you can um, see the, you know, there's certain areas where it's just rock hard and others it's really, you know, good soil. And so this was really variable, but, so we have one half acre section um, at the end where we just mowed it, and then we planted our trees. And we do vegetation plots through that every month. Um, the second one, we laid out mats. Um, the third one, we just herbicided the whole section first, then we planted the trees. And so we're, we're going through and um, doing vegetation plots through those sections every month to see the difference between these initial treatments and what is coming up. And um, so it's a two-year grant period, and um, I will analyze the results at the end of year two. We're at the end of year one right now. But just initially what I've seen is that the herbicide treatment suppressed it for the longest amount of time initially. And everything has weeds now. So we'll have to see at the end of year two if there's some significant difference in these treatments. But uh, the mat section obviously did the best. We, the hurricane ripped up some of our mats for us. Um, and we still have one down that we're about to take up and, and see. So everything, we did the treatment and then we seeded with native species. Um, and then, but the mat section, our trees died more in the mat section because they didn't have um, as much access to water because the mat sort of blocked some of that. So we lost more trees in the mats, and that was certainly the most expensive. The mulch section um, has done fairly well. The tilling section um, did awful from the start. It was just, we tilled it and weeds just came back immediately. So I think, you know, we have 70 parks that we're going to do these buffers in, and there, there are so many questions and that could be answered and so much research. I'm going to do, in some of these parts, measure the water um, from runoff before it goes into the site and then after. So we'll have collection devices on the upper end and it'll collect the water. And then we'll have collection devices, um, you know, downstream of that, um, that riparian area so that we can compare bef before and after it goes through that. And, um, 
you know, also more on tree survival, sediment, um, microbes. There's just unlimited stuff that we can do, and we have a lot of parks to do it. So I think we'll, we'll probably get some really good data from this. White Oak Parkway is one, and that's one of our enhancement ones. It was already forested. It was just, and still is, completely full of invasive species. It, there's a wetland area. It's got elephant ear. Um, you know, just such diverse. It, there's Tree of Heaven, China Berry, Chinese Tallow. It, this is like the, a really good example of invasive, if you want to do a, a class on invasive. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're working on it. We've had a crew out there, and we partner with Houston Audubon, and this is one of their bird-friendly communities. And uh, there's a really good birder that's out there all the time, and there's been over 150 species identified. And this is just a 10-acre section that we're working in. And you're standing there, I-10. You can see I-10. You can see downtown Houston. I saw a coyote run through there a few weeks ago, uh, which is another thing. So these riparian areas are really these corridors. We had a feral hog at Robert C. Stewart Park. They just travel these riparian boundary. So I think this is a really good opportunity for the water quality stuff and then wildlife. And we're doing bird surveys at Milby and White Oak and, um, and vegetation surveys. And so I just think that there will be good data coming out of these. Um, this, and we partner with Student Conservation Association at Milby. Um, and so they had crews. They planted all the trees. We do community events. Um, here's our mat section. Um, and so that, certainly, there is nothing under there when we pull up the mats, but it'll be interesting to see what, what comes up, if it was able to, you know, really suppress, kill that seed bank, or if it, if it just held it off and then it's going to come right back. And this was, I think this was our mulch area, which you can't see the mulch now, but um, the trees are looking pretty good over there. And so, and this was just after year one, and the trees we planted were five and 15 gallon trees. One of our biggest struggles with these areas is watering. So getting these trees watered. We put in over 2,000 trees at Milby. And, you know, how do you water? And so we, and one thing at Milby, since we were doing all these plots, was we didn't want to, you know, put sprinklers out there. So we don't want to water the weeds. So each tree, we water each tree. So I have two interns dedicated to this site. Um, and each tree is watered. And so I think one, one big struggle with that is keeping up with that at White Oak. We planted trees within, you know, existing trees. So finding the trees that we planted is our biggest struggle there. And we flagged them, and that one is frequently flooded, White Oak is. And so, um, you know, our biggest struggle at White Oak is you sometimes you come out and your trees are all gone. You know, you had a big rain, and even, you know, I didn't even know it rained. I live in Pearland. I didn't even know it rained in Houston. I come to White Oak, and the trees are all gone, <laughs> or there, and there's trash. So... That's a big struggle, and we've seen um, if we put in big trees, 15-gallon, 30-gallon trees in that site, those are gone. So the five-gallon trees seem to do better and don't get washed away. They just get covered in trash. So as long as we show up, <laughs> get the trash off the trees so it doesn't bend them. So the, the five-gallon seem to do better in these flooded areas um, and because, um, you know, the water just, the, the big ones just don't get in deep enough, I guess, and, and it takes longer for their roots to take hold, and so they just get washed away. So, thank you. <laughs>